tonight as rising temperatures threaten more wildfire destruction. Stories of compassion and resilience. Hoping for some, some survive that I can hang on to. And one Alberta community's open door policy for neighbors in crisis. Like everything to be outfitted, it's amazing. Yeah, very amazing, very touching. The Canadian singer hoping to match Celine Dion at Eurovision. I will always be a Quebec Canadian girl, you know, it's uh, I miss it very much. He built the company, she co-wrote the book, so what about Blackberry the movie? The general consensus is it's 5% accurate and 95% made up. This is The National with Ian Hanamansi. A warning for Albertans tonight. After a short reprieve, the risk of more wildfires is expected to soar over the course of the weekend. Already thousands have been forced to flee their homes since the first flames were sparked. Most still can't return. Right now, the danger zone is centered around the northern part of the province, but each day that zone is expected to grow, fueled by dry conditions and scorching temperatures. By Sunday, almost all of Alberta could be covered in red, indicating an extreme risk of danger. As more people are forced to evacuate, others are stepping up to take them in, including one community that's very familiar with the hardships of being displaced. Katie Nicholson takes us there. After gut-wrenching loss, overwhelming generosity. I've got toothbrushes, toothpaste, uh, clothing from toddlers to adults. Everything for fire evacuees in high level. Chris French drove three hours to deliver these donations. <laughs> Worth it. Like, people have lost their homes. Um, I, I genuinely can't imagine what would happen if that were me. Inside, piles of clothes being sorted. You're only seeing a little bit of what the donations are. An outpouring of support for people who have lost everything. From Toronto to PEI, uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, you name it, right across. This was the chaotic scramble last week from Fox Lake. Lines of evacuees waiting in terror for boats to take them across the river to safety. The community has lost 100 homes and its only grocery store. It's too hard for Bobby Zeke to talk about that day and the loss he feels. It's just weird for me because I'm never away from over there this long. High level is no stranger to evacuations. Many here have been evacuees themselves. We learn from every fire, from Slave Lake, from, from um, um, Fort Mac. You know, we've, every time we learn what's happening and in, in our own uh, evacuation, we learn that we're best suited to look after the people from the north. That means doing everything it can to make its newest residents feel welcome, even hosting special swims. Just to see them, how excited they are, even when they come, is just such a blessing. The local pool also inundated with more donations. Like even swim diapers, shampoos, conditioners, soaps, like everything to be outfitted, it's amazing. Yeah, very amazing, very touching. The pharmacy doing its best to fill prescriptions for evacuees and replace lost mobility aids. It's like typical small town vibes, right? So you try to help out, you're kind of like a little community. Um, we're like a little isolated pocket, right? And Katie joins us now from high level. Katie, plenty of generosity, but also a sense of concern. Yeah, and it is hot and dry and now it's windy, not ideal firefighting conditions here. Uh, this whole area is like a tinderbox, uh, this region. You also have to realize high level is between uh, two really big fires, one to the east, one to the west, both out of control. Concerns, these conditions that are expected to last well into next week could prompt more evacuations uh, and more evacuees coming here. The mayor says that she will welcome everybody. Thanks, Katie. Of the thousands still under evacuation orders, some have been allowed to return home briefly. A chance to grab something important from a house still standing or sift through the ashes of one that isn't. Erin Collins got to see that up close. Physical damage from a wildfire, easy to see. But look a little closer and the real impact is revealed. A life built over decades destroyed in an instant. I don't even want to dig it. I don't know. Yep. 
Well, you gotta stay busy, maybe. Hoping, no, no, I think it's just hoping for some some survive that I can hang on to. But if I don't find it, it's part of letting go, accepting, and carrying on. I guess I don't know. Smoke rolled into this part of the East Prairie Métis settlement on Friday. Fire raced through this community shortly after, taking more than 50 buildings with it, including 14 homes. It was only us, and then uh, we, we did our best to do whatever we could do with the equipment that we had, and with very minimal equipment. And then we waited for help from forestry. Help has arrived now. Across the highway, crews work to put out the fire still burning just over the horizon here. Important work as temperatures are expected to rise in Alberta this weekend, potentially stoking the dozens of fires still burning in the province. A worry for those just trying to find a way to move forward. The cattle are gone from this pasture, but they'll be back saved from the flames that took the house here. When that fire came through here, your first thought was for the cattle. Yeah. Because our cattle are, are my future, my daughter's future, my grandkids' future. Everything else I could get, if the, if the cattle did, if I did lose the cattle, I would have probably just gave up. Hope and resilience. Things it would seem even the biggest fire can't burn off. Aaron Collins, CBC News, on the East Prairie Métis Settlement in Alberta. The government is under intense pressure tonight to spend millions on a thorough search of a Manitoba landfill to find the remains of murdered Indigenous women. A new study says that search is possible. The women's families say it's crucial. Brittany Greenslade looks at the challenges ahead. It's a massive area filled with garbage and possibly the remains of missing and murdered women. For five months, their families have been calling for all of this to be searched to find those remains. And now a long-awaited feasibility study says that search is possible, and First Nations leaders say it must happen. If a search is not carried out, it will demonstrate to all First Nations across Canada that this government condones the despairing act of disposing of First Nation women in landfills. Prairie Green landfills were the bodies of Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron, and possibly a third unknown victim known as Buffalo Woman may be. All believed to be victims of alleged serial killer Jeremy Skabicki. The report says a search for their remains could take up to three years and cost as much as $184 million. You cannot put a price on the lives of First Nation women or the horrific and profound loss their families have experienced. While a search would come with health and safety risks, and there's no guarantee the bodies would be found, the families say the women deserve a proper resting place. We have no place to go to lay flowers down. We have no place to go to send our condolences or pay our respects. They're not trash. It shouldn't be a question whether to search or not. Let's not fail these women and let's bring them home. The report was commissioned by the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs and funded by the federal government, which so far has given no outright commitment to fund the search. It's a substantial amount of money, uh, but as the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs said, uh, what signal do you send if, uh, if you don't search for uh, First Nations bodies that have been disposed? The report also calls for GPS monitoring on all garbage trucks across Canada, along with surveillance monitoring at the entrances and exits of landfills. Brittany Greenslade, CBC News, Winnipeg. Some concern tonight that a major deal to bring a huge vehicle battery plant to Windsor, Ontario, could be on rocky ground. Auto announced the deal with auto giant Stellantis months ago, but now it's reportedly renegotiating the terms amid worries the company may pull out. Sources say Stellantis wants the federal and Ontario governments to match the big subsidies they announced in a separate deal with Volkswagen. Now to the U.S.-Mexico border, where a surge of migrants into the U.S. didn't materialize as expected. But with new rules against illegal crossings now in effect, hundreds are filling shelters in a waiting game. Katie Simpson is in El Paso again tonight, showing us what it's like. 
Nearly all of the beds in this emergency shelter are already accounted for. It's a space mostly for families seeking asylum, where they have a chance to clean the little they have, and where kids can run around and be kids. We can have, I want to say, about 70 people in here. Nicole Rie uh, says resources in border communities have been stretched thin for months, well before the big policy change. I know a lot of our staff is kind of burnt out at this point, and it's just starting to ramp up again. Lineups to enter the U.S. largely held steady in the hours after Title 42 ended. There was no immediate surge and no chaos, though plenty of confusion as migrants surrendered under the new immigration rules. Uh, we're prioritizing those most vulnerable populations. We're doing this as quickly and as efficiently and as safely as we possibly can. Asylum seekers continue to be sent to already overcrowded immigration facilities, which are expected to get busier after a judge blocked the White White House plan to release some vetted migrants into the U.S. without court dates or ways to track them. It's a very harmful ruling and the Department of Justice is considering uh, our options. Migrants worry changing rules may hurt their chances at starting a new life. Jorge is a home builder fleeing Venezuela who was turned away once before. Bueno, a Chicago. I'm going to Chicago, but I wanted to go to Canada, he says. Being here is the dream. Right now we have about 220 with us, our capacity is 230. Support workers also worry these spaces will soon be at capacity. That is one of our concerns is, is where we're going to put everybody because um, we've had our streets filled with people sleeping on the streets and it's just it's a humanitarian crisis. A crisis that has no quick solutions and is likely about to become the norm. Katie Simpson, CBC News, El Paso. It is official Elon Musk has confirmed media executive Linda Yaccarino as the new CEO of Twitter. Many of you in this room know me and you know I pride myself on my work ethic, but buddy, I met my match. Yaccarino comes from NBC Universal where she ran advertising and helped launch the Peacock streaming service. Musk says she'll take over Twitter in six weeks, running business operations, so he can focus on the tech side. A former U.S. Marine who killed a homeless street performer on a New York subway has been charged. The killing of Jordan Neely was caught on video, and some of you may find the images in Susan Ormiston's report disturbing. As she shows us, the outrage and debate sparked by the incident is moving to a courtroom. Daniel Penny, a 24-year-old former U.S. Marine, is charged with second-degree manslaughter after he choked a subway passenger to death. It was on the New York Metro May 1st. Jordan Neely, a 30-year-old street performer who loved to impersonate Michael Jackson, suffered from mental illness and was often homeless. That day, he was agitated, according to witnesses asking for food, shouting he was ready to die. Daniel Penny pinned him to the ground, put him in a chokehold for several minutes and kept the pressure on for some time after Neely stopped moving. Mr. Neely did not attack anyone. He did not touch anyone. He did not hit anyone. But he was choked to death, and that can't stand. The family wanted a murder charge. With manslaughter, prosecutors will have to prove Penny may not have intended to kill Neely, but acted recklessly, choking him far longer than needed to subdue him. And he chose to continue to hold that chokehold minute after minute, second after second, until there was no life left. For more than a week, protesters had demanded Penny be arrested, the case stirring up tensions over race, homelessness and mental illness, up against the fears in New York City that crime is rising, particularly on the metro. A mental issue on a train is not to be sentenced with death. New York's mayor has been under pressure in the wake of the killing. One thing we can say for sure, Jordan Neely did not deserve to die. Lawyers for Daniel Penny will argue that he was trying to protect others and that he willingly turned himself in. He did so voluntarily and with the sort of dignity and integrity that is characteristic of his history of service to this grateful nation. But this case will hinge not on Penny's prior military service, but what threat justified choking a man to death on the F train. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Russia says Ukrainian missiles hit the occupied city of Luhansk, injuring six children and a politician. Those claims couldn't be verified. Amid growing signs, Ukraine is gaining ground in the war. 
окупанти вже внутрішньо готові до поразки. The Ukrainian president said Russian occupiers have already lost the war in their minds. For a second day, the head of Russia's mercenary army attacking Bakhmut described a collapse at the front, soldiers abandoning positions. Attempts by defense ministry to sugarcoat the situation will lead to global tragedy for Russia, he said. Adding to Moscow's concerns, apparent missile strikes on the occupied city of Luhansk reportedly hitting a supply and repair facility for the Russian army, though Russia said only unused factories were damaged. The city well outside the range of confirmed weaponry Ukraine has been using, at least until now. Political change may be coming to Thailand as the country gears up for a general election this weekend. But as Salima Shivji shows us, it's not guaranteed that the voters will choose the next government. The crowd surges. The cheers are irrepressible for the Putai party. This fervor is centered around Petong Tarn Shinawat, running to become Thailand's next prime minister. Shinawat is heir to a political dynasty created by her father, a popular exiled former leader. I love her father, Taksin, this man says. And she's a good leader. She'll take Thailand to a better place. They're waging a battle to bring democracy back to a country that's been in the grips of its conservative military establishment for a decade. The Putai party is leading in the polls, followed closely by another opposition party promising even more dramatic change. But that may not matter in a country where the system is skewed in favor of pro-military candidates. Thailand's 250 senators appointed by the military can vote on who will be the next prime minister, regardless of what voters say. <laughs> That steep challenge and effective veto is shrugged off by the pro-democracy parties, campaigning hard for change. The progressive move forward is surging, a party that's even questioning what's long been taboo here, the sweeping power of Thailand's monarchy, and it's resonating with the young. It's a new uh, new party and it's like bring our hope back. Lately the polls seem positive. But I'm not, I'm not sure because like as a Thai people, we have been betrayed before. And the incumbent former military junta head Prayuth Chan Ocha still has support with the older generation. Prayuth's party is loyal. They love the king, the nation, says the 77-year-old. Still, with a pro-democratic vote crystallizing, many see this election as far from straightforward. The democratic process in Thailand has always been crooked. The real question, this expert says, is what will happen after Sunday's vote? How will the military establishment react? Short of a coup itself, uh, we've seen party dissolutions. So they might go there again. And then we would have a very tense environment uh, leading to public confrontation and potentially a clash. That uncertainty leading to an unequivocal message from the parties. Every vote counts. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Bangkok. And voters in Toronto are now just over six weeks away from choosing their next mayor. While a whopping 102 candidates have officially registered to run, few seem to be registering with the electorate. Here's Ithil Musa. While Toronto Maple Leafs geared up for a do-or-die playoff game, Toronto mayoral hopefuls are preparing for a power play of their own. Candidate nominations for Toronto's mayoral by-election have officially closed, and more than 100 people are vying to lead Canada's biggest city. But any name recognition is hard to find. I actually couldn't name one candidate. No, I, can't. I couldn't, to be honest with you. I couldn't name anyone. John Tory was re-elected as mayor for a third term this past fall. He resigned in February following revelations of an extramarital affair, triggering the by-election. I've decided that I will step down as mayor so that I can take the time to reflect on my mistakes. Political experts say the race, which is projected to cost $13 million, will likely come down to a handful of people. This election could be really interesting in terms of becoming a lightning rod for a whole host of issues that not just Torontonians but Canadians are concerned about. Uh, standard of living, health care, housing, you know, these are the big, big issues. 
Annette Trevorrow Gasher knows that firsthand. Her apartment complex in Toronto is being demolished. The developer is promising residents that they can return once the new building is complete, but some don't buy it. Returning to the building may be unaffordable for me, and it scares me. I'm terrified. The cost of housing will likely be a key issue in this race as Toronto City Councillors officially declare homelessness an emergency. Ithil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. Your research is backing up something many suffering from concussions already know. Symptoms can drag on much longer than anticipated. The symptoms just never ever went away and got worse, got much worse over time. Why some say current treatments need a rethink. Next. The story behind Canada's most famous smartphone. What do you call it? It's called a Blackberry. Hmm. Try typing with your thumbs. Jim Balsillie helps us separate fact from fiction in the movie version of Blackberry. And a little later. The Canadian-born singer competing for the top prize at Eurovision. We're back in two. McDonald's and one of its franchise holders have been found liable for negligence for failing to warn customers about the dangerous temperature of chicken McNuggets. A nugget from a Happy Meal caused second-degree burns on a girl's leg in South Florida. A trial is expected later this summer to determine how much money she should get. With growing awareness of sports-related concussions, new research shows recovery may not be so easy for the rest of us either. Here's Lauren Pelly on how some are suffering and what can be done about it. Michelle Tobin Forgrave says it takes all her brain power just to make a cup of coffee. After a concussion five years ago, she says she started forgetting basic tasks, even the names of household appliances. I literally couldn't remember words. At just 51 years old, Tobin Forgrave can no longer work. She still struggles with serious forgetfulness, fatigue and vision issues. The symptoms just never ever went away and got worse, got much worse over time. Health Canada's online guidance says while concussion recovery times can vary, most people get better in a month or less. But a new study out of the UK found nearly half of people with a concussion still showed some symptoms six months later. What I hope this study will achieve is to have clinicians think twice or three times before they send somebody with concussion home and tell them, you're healthy, go home. This neurologist says while the study's sample size was small, it does show real biological changes can occur in the brain. How can someone have all of these symptoms after this, you know, somewhat trivial head knock? Well, in, in a vulnerable brain, that can absolutely happen. He feels more research is needed to understand why some people get better while others don't. If they're already predisposed, or at risk for mental health conditions or already experiencing things like anxiety, depression or chronic headache or chronic pain disorders. Those are known risk factors for having longer recovery periods after a concussion. Tobin Forgrave has been to more than a dozen specialists but still doesn't have a full roadmap to recovery. Doctors need to be trained on the latest information and protocol for concussion and, and brain injury. New international recommendations are expected by this summer. Health Canada says it'll be keeping those in mind when updating Canada's own concussion guidelines, something experts say is overdue. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Police in Ontario are expressing concern about what they say is a growing trend in teen violence. Like most of the time, I think it's just like a group, like targeting on one person. Yeah, it's a swarming. But, yeah. Up next, Ellen Morrow investigates the issue of teen swarmings. Plus, the story behind the iconic Canadian smartphone hits the big screens. Picture a cell phone and an email machine all in one thing. How accurate is Blackberry the movie? One of the company's former CEOs has some thoughts. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. Police near Toronto are worried about an apparent growing trend, teen violence. Just last weekend, skirmishes erupted at the opening of an amusement park. Ellen Morrow looks at one disturbing type of attack, swarming. 
The story contains scenes that show how violent things can get and what police are doing about it. The rowdy and violent opening weekend at Canada's Wonderland. Teens at the center of all of it. Some called it Wonderland Fight Club, and it's not hard to see why. Tell me how you feel when you see them. It's scary. Definitely yeah. concerning, yeah. right? So this has sort of been something that you've been noticing getting worse over the yeah. last few yeah. years? Yeah. A few years back, like when I was, of course, like 13, 14, 15 years old, it was not like this. It was getting out of hand. All that chaos wasn't a total surprise, or at least it shouldn't have been. We've been looking into teen violence, specifically the issue of teen swarmings, where a group may attack a person or a smaller group for several months now. We even interviewed the police from this area earlier this year who told us that it's a growing problem. I really can't recall ever a time before this past summer uh, seeing this happening. That was Constable Laura Nicole from the York Regional Police in March, telling us it was so bad last summer, police had extra patrols near Wonderland, an anti-swarming effort called Operation Behave. This is a group of kids going out to have fun. Maybe a few of them start making a bad decision and then others are being pulled into it, kind of in that mob mentality. With similar violence happening already this year, we caught up with the York Regional Police again. Sergeant Clint Whitney. Operation Behave is starting back up. We're going to be enforcing things with a zero tolerance approach and we're going to be doing our best to make sure that everybody feels safe to come and enjoy time in our community. But this goes so far beyond Canada's Wonderland. We decided to look into teen swarmings after a string of high profile attacks across the country. This one last year targeting a 15-year-old girl in British Columbia. Police swarmed by teens at this out-of-control house party in Winnipeg. And most shocking of all, the downtown Toronto swarming that killed 59-year-old Ken Lee. Eight girls, ranging from just 13 to 16 years old, charged with his murder. We reached out to police departments across the country, but it can be really hard to gather precise data on teen swarmings because swarming isn't actually the criminal charge. It could be something like robbery or assault, for example. So what we did do to try to get answers was gather these newspaper articles from across the country over the last several years on teen swarmings. And what they showed us was that there were at least 20 in 2022 versus about seven in 2021. They also show us that this year is on track to be even worse. Okay. Looks like a bunch of teenagers up to no good. Tracy Viancourt is a Canada Research Chair in Children's Mental Health and Violence Prevention at the University of Ottawa. This poor girl, this teenage girl I imagine, they're making them kiss her feet. What is your reaction to that? It doesn't surprise me what I'm seeing. Tracy says teens, especially in groups, can be bad at evaluating risk. You think you're more anonymous than you are. In a sense, you're like outside of your body and your decision making is faulty. What role does social media play into this teen swarming issue? The truth of the matter is they get a lot of rewards from it. I can't tell you how often is the case now where instead of calling 911, they pick up their phone and they record somebody being attacked. Throw in the isolation of the pandemic, teens now back in groups after years of stifled social development, plus an increasingly fractured, even hostile society, and it can be a volatile mix. Little incivilities that you see every day, the trolling that we see online. Our cultural norms are about being rude, and being aggressive, then that catches on and then they get used to that. And what seems like a fleeting fight can have lifelong consequences. The physical impact of the injury was 
pretty devastating. Like, like we met Jonathan Wambach in the winter, jumped by a group of teens nearly 25 years ago. He was in a coma for three months and has permanent brain damage. At first, I couldn't talk, I couldn't move. Um, I had to relearn how to do essentially everything. I had to relearn how to breathe. So when you see in the news reports of swarming, how does that make you feel? I mean, obviously, it's very triggering, like seeing this sort of stuff happening over and over again. What would you say to someone who might think that they would carry out a swarming about the lifelong impact it can have on a victim? I think I would say think about your family, think about your friends, think about your loved ones. Would you want something like this to happen to them? Back at Wonderland, the goal now is making this chaos a one-off. Perhaps if teenagers are coming here and they get a little unruly, they need to know that there can be consequences to that. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. And we did reach out to Canada's Wonderland about the incidents last weekend. In a statement, they said they have zero tolerance for this kind of behaviour and have enhanced security and police presence. Blackberry the movie is now out in theaters, chronicling the dramatic highs and lows of one of Canada's most famous tech companies. Are you selling more phones? What the hell do you think I've been doing over here, Mike? We're in the middle of a hostile takeover! How true to real life is the new film? One of Blackberry's former CEOs will join our panel to sort that out. Coming up next. With the new Blackberry movie in theaters this weekend, we thought it was a good opportunity to take a look at that Canadian invention that changed the way the world communicates and eventually was eclipsed by the iPhone. Picture a cell phone and an email machine all in one thing. The movie gives a behind the scenes look at the rise and fall of Blackberry. I want 50% of the company and I've got to be CEO. And its co-CEOs, Mike Lazaridis and Jim Valsoli. But how accurate is that portrayal? You said they were the best engineers in the world. I said they're the best engineers in Canada. And what about the handheld device that inspired it? Joining us to talk about that, one of those co-CEOs, Jim Balsillie, and Jackie McNish, who co-wrote Losing the Signal, the untold story behind the extraordinary rise and spectacular fall of BlackBerry that the film is loosely based on. Welcome to both of you. Pleasure Good to be here. Uh, Jackie, let's start with you. In, in terms of the history of tech advances, where does the BlackBerry belong? Oh, it, it's got to be like the fastest uh, penetrator of new technology in the history of technology. We took the television um, five decades to penetrate more than 50% of the market. After the first BlackBerry was introduced in 1998, uh, it was only a matter of a couple of years before Research in Motion, the, the company that created it, um, co you know, controlled over 50% of the North American smartphone market and 20% of the global market. It's an extraordinary story uh, of, of rapid technology penetration. And, and Jim, pick up on that. What do you hope people remember about the BlackBerry? Well, I think uh, what they should remember is just how special Mike and our teams were uh, and how very gifted they were. But really, most days, you're just burning the candle at both ends, sleeping with one eye open, because it was so fast-paced, such you're competing with the, the, the toughest and smartest people in the world. And you have to remember Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Nokia, and other companies tried to build smartphones, and they couldn't. So the pace was fast, and the competition was fierce. Which brings me, Jackie, to this. I know it's a complicated story, but what's the short version on how BlackBerry was, was beaten by the iPhone? Well, basically, Steve Jobs changed the game. Steve Jobs at, at Apple said he would never get into this, the mobile phone business. He hated the carriers, but he made a deal with the carrier so that he could get what he wanted. And within a few years of the BlackBerry, um, succeeding and, and growing so quickly. He came on stage and in 2007 and he, they already had the iPad, so we're going to add the iPad, a mobile phone, and we're going to give you internet access to, to maps and photos and videos. And we are calling it iPhone. 
he already had a huge following and that phone when it came out was called the Jesus phone by its fans. It was just sort of a fait accompli that they were going to be able to control a large share of the U.S. retail market and they had a carrier in their pocket with an exclusive contract that was going to invest billions of dollars in upgrading the very primitive mobile data networks that, that BlackBerry was working on, for example. They were, you know, it was early days for those markets. And that just gave them an enormous advantage. And you know, Research in Motion was slow to respond to it. I say slow to respond with some sympathy. They were scaling, trying to keep up with enormous growth and demand. But within a few years of Apple launching the iPhone, RIM was retreating from the field. Jim, I'm one of those people who tried to hang on to BlackBerry as long as I could. I kept buying the new models, and, and after a while, it kind of got disappointing. I wasn't getting the features th th that I needed. And so from your perspective, what went wrong? Well, the old expression is who wins the battle between an alligator and a bear. It depends on the terrain. And what happened was Apple changed the tr terrain with their new computing environment, and Google changed it with a subsidized uh, data exchange model. So I spent a couple of years trying to build a service on our services business. I tried to persuade the board and Mike to get out of hardware because it didn't favor us anymore, but we had a very profitable and growing services business. And, um, and I wanted to open that to other devices, but Mike said that would kill hardware. And I said, hardware is already dead. And he persuaded the board to double down on hardware with the storm and then with the BB 10, which were disasters. And, they abandoned the services business in that approach, and that's when I retired from the board and wished them luck, and I thought it was a suicide march. So, Jim, let's talk about the movie. You do not come across well at all. Are you selling more phones? What the hell do you think I've been doing over here, Mike? We're in the middle of a hostile takeover! Why do you have so many babies that you for? Okay. Your character, I mean, it's supposed to be you, arrogant, yeah. obsessed with so getting an NHL team instead of running or co-running your company, and yet you took part in the movie premiere. Uh, how accurate is that movie portrayal of you? Well, I mean, first of all, I have to say how, re how relieved I was they found someone so good looking to play me because <laughs> Len Howerton is one ha handsome Tasmanian devil. But the film is not an accurate per portrayal of Rim at all, nor my relationship with Mike. And, and what about an uh, accurate portrayal of you? Because as I say, you come across as somebody without really many good characteristics and a lot of bad ones. Well, ma many employees have been very vocal in pointing out to the mischaracterizations, and there's been a, a piece in the National Post today, and I suspect there's more to come. The, the general consensus is it's 5% accurate and 95% made up. And you do have to remember that uh, I've lived 60 years with the word silly in my last name, so I can handle being teased. You do seem to be taking it uh, well. Uh, Jackie, your book set out to tell the, the true story of BlackBerry, so on a scale of 1 to 10, how accurate is the film? Uh, it depends what you mean by accurate. If you're going to talk about the facts, a lot of the facts are wrong. But you're comparing a book to a movie. And a movie, you know, our job was to basically tell the history of this company that hadn't been told. You're in the film business, you're in the entertainment business, and you and it's often you interpret the facts and re-examine re and reconfigure it because it's the entertainment business. I mean, Hollywood, I mean, think of Westerns and all the Westerns and the stories that they told that had no bearing in the history. It's not what people care about when they go to movies. They don't care a lot about facts. And this film, I have to give them credit for creating a very energetic, um, remarkable look at the tension that exists in a technology company that's facing the kind of competition, the fun that they had. You know, while there's so many facts are not correct, it's, it is a very thrilling film to watch. Yeah, it's easy to watch. I certainly did enjoy uh, watching it. Uh, now, Jim, you won't be surprised to hear your former co-CEO, Mike, did not reply to our request for an interview. He hasn't taken part in the publicity for the movie, as far as I know. What's your relationship like with him these days? Well, Mike and I had, uh, Mike and I have seen each other a couple times at social events, but when we had our working partnership, it was a very professional relationship. We didn't spend time outside of work, but we talked every day for 20 years, and he has remarkable skills. I had my unique skills. And when we brought them together with that overlap, it was one and one is three, and it created magic. And that's where we took an idea from Waterloo to $20 billion sales in a span of 12 years.
Well, I've been very open about the fact that I loved the Blackberry. I'm sorry to see it go. Uh, and, uh, and I love the movie. So really nice talking to both of you about that. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. And the Blackberry movie is out in theaters now. And it's also coming to CBC in the fall. Coming up, a Canadian singer could bring home Eurovision's top prize, but it won't be for Canada. Plus... So cute, it's ridiculous. For the first time in 36 years, the Calgary Zoo welcomes an endangered baby lemur in our moment. Cousins with Gudas driving the lane. Nick Cousins scores! And with that overtime goal by the Florida Panthers, the Toronto Maple Police are out of the Stanley Cup playoffs. They tied the game 2-2 just minutes before the end of regulation time. The Edmonton Oilers are now the only Canadian team left in the playoffs. On the eve of the Eurovision Song Contest final, a Canadian singer may be set to steal the show. This puts her at the center of a global television event seen last year by 160 million people. As Deanna Sumanag Johnson shows us, other Canadians can play a part as well. Her voice is reminiscent of Edith Piaf. But the woman France is counting on to break its four-decade dry spell at Eurovision grew up in Canada. Montreal is multicultural, and I, was, I had a chance to grow up with so many different uh, people coming from different countries. And it really, you know, it, it, you can feel it in the music, you know. Sometimes I put some uh, Asian violin in my music. Sometimes it's going to be more oriental. There are some good precedents to go by. When young Celine Dion represented Switzerland in 1988, she won. Lazara faces stiff competition from 25 other finalists. They include some big personalities and big voices like Sweden's Lorene. She's got a really powerful voice. It's kind of electronic pop. She's got a huge set where she's kind of, some people are saying it looks like she's in a panini oven. Now, that's classic Eurovision, but there are changes this year. Non-Europeans can for the first time vote in the contest, which could mean some extra sway for Lazara. If we win, like it's definitely a win for France, but it's also a win for Canada because uh, we're, we, we come from Montreal, and it's 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 always difficult to uh, uh, go out of Montreal and and try to reach the the, the, the European market. Canadians can watch on Saturday through a YouTube subscription, but if you want to vote, it'll cost you about dollar fifty per vote. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, this little one might get every vote in a cuteness contest. You're looking at the Calgary Zoo's new baby lemur, a black and white ruffled lemur, if you'd like to be specific. The species is critically endangered, meaning this newborn isn't just cute, it's a cause for celebration. And the newest addition to the Calgary lemur family is our moment. So this little pup was born on April 7th. We're super excited to have it here and we're falling in love with it already. The species of the black and white rough lemur, uh, they're from Madagascar and they're one of a, a critically endangered species. Critically endangered is, you know, one step above extinct. So their numbers are decreasing every year and it's mostly due to deforestation. The last black and white rough lemur that was born at the Wilder Institute Calgary Zoo was in 1987. So this little one is pretty important for that. We're not sure if it's a female or male, uh, not quite yet. It's very active, it's bright, it's moving more and more each day. Um, it's <laughs> climbing uh, over everything and ropes and mom and dad are very, very protective of, of it. So they'll, they'll keep coming and, and grabbing it and making it safe. 
so immeasurably cute, and it's not lost on us that that is happening in Alberta province uh, this weekend in particular that is really worried about the dire consequences of the wildfire, something that we continue to watch very closely here on CBC News. That is The National for May 12th. I hope you join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. Our main topic is going to be on Cross Country Checkup, uh, what it's been like if you've ever gotten that knock on the door from emergency officials and they've said you have to leave right away either because of a flood or a fire. And later Sunday, I'll be right here for The National. Have a good night.